Hello, Crystal. Hi, Emily. So good to see you. Oh my gosh, it's so good to see you. But so I always start with the same with this the same way. How do we know each other? Wow, isn't it something? It feels like forever. Like we <laughs> literally met at a at a salon event in Russian Hills in San Francisco, right? And I'm certain you know, in hindsight, what both drove us to this event makes sense as to why we vibed so much, right? Why we connected, right? It was um, a Richard Branson's foundation event, and it was about um, fixing criminal justice system. And um, everyone in the room was lovely, and you and I just started to talk, and I think it was after hearing the presentation, though, I think. I feel like that's when the two of us really just sort of connected around the talk and um, the Magnolia Mafia. What would you consider your oldest Southern female friendship and what does it bring to your life? Oh my gosh. So um, I still talk to my three friends from seventh grade, family, um, rarely do you, it's funny, rarely do we talk a lot about politics, things like that, but there is just this connection that we have in some ways, I think you'll understand around family. And, you know, there, our mothers cared for us like we were daughters that they had birthed. Um, and so I, I think about just the, um, level of commitment we have had to, each other right and how we celebrate when there's something to celebrate we we've been the ones when oh I'm getting married you know I think I've hosted bridal and baby showers <laughs> for each right um so so you know it's it's those people that you just go to Emily you can understand this and there's no explanation needed there's something about um southern women the way we bond right I, I, and you can tell me if you think I think we watch our moms. We watched our mothers and their girlfriends, right? And their sisters. And their sisters. That's their right. sisters and their sisters. And their sisters. That is exactly Because it wasn't just with many of those women. It, it wasn't just a friendship. It was sort of a collective. That's exactly right. I remember growing up, Emily, in Houston, every Friday night from like the time I can remember up until maybe like late to middle school, my parents got, you know, gathered with the same families every Friday night. And I think about how, as I was older, moved to New York and lived in different places, I craved that. And I just had this, I just had this um, experience in breaking down my mom's house this summer and going through like all of her like big, like serving dishes and yes. sort of party wear. And one thing, and, and it's funny because I, I will just say this the whole time. I know you'll know what I'm saying. Right. Um, one thing that was sort of ubiquitous as a child is like, I would be the dishwasher and there was always a piece of tape on the back of those serving platters that had my mother's name, my grandmother's name, my aunt's name, because those dishes were gone from our house so often. You know, there was a birthday, there was a barbecue, there was a funeral. Those dishes went away from our house. And there's always masking tape and it said Francis or Barbara, you know. And I was doing all of these dishes and there was all this tape and I thought my serving dishes in Los Angeles don't have my name on them. Listen. And they when go I, and stay. That, right. Exactly. I, I remember it walking down the street one day in New York and I it was like, you know, Friday you work and it's winding down. And I thought about how I was about to go spend my evening. And I said, this is so far from what I knew growing up, right? I mean, Friday was like, it was this instant party and connection house party with the 
And I started to think about the number of people I interacted with that I had ever invited home Mm. or, you know, just, it was so different. And there was, I have to tell you, it was in that moment I started thinking I wanted to try and figure out how to recreate that for my life. Like that piece of my life was missing. And then it's church on Sunday. And to your point, I mean, I grew up going to visit my grandparents after Sunday dinner in the country. And like just all of these things I thought I so missed and craved because they made me essentially who I am, right? Yeah. And um, but there's just something that I think about Southern living, that connection and that, you know, sense of camaraderie. But also I think for, for, for Black women, women of color in the South, it's been in some ways around survival, right? You know, you think about um, survival, e- even, even at different socioeconomic levels, right? It's been just how do we collaborate to raise our children? Like, I, just, mm. I can just think about so many stories of um, women and hearing and seeing women just come together to make certain their families had what they had, what their children had, what they needed. And, and, and I, I think, too, just um, a sense of security, right? Yeah. A sense of, of belonging and security. And um, to your point, it, it, it is a mafia. And, and I even think about, to your point, what it looks like when these worlds can come together, right? When white women, Black women, women of color, in the South can bring back those values of, of real authentic sisterhood. Um, yeah. I think it would be just beautiful. This is a part of the culture that begins at birth in the South and women are sort of raised to create these pods of survival That's exactly right. with each other. Um, and you and you you do not break it you know like it is it glued in this deep deep love and respect for one another why do you think it doesn't exist like this in other places you know i i have tried to figure it out and um there are a few things come to mind i think that there's so much focus sometimes. I know when I was, I'll take it when I lived in New York, right? And in DC, people were just so focused on getting ahead in their careers. And I'm not, I'm not uh, anti-career. I mean, I focus a lot on my work too. But I just felt like people were so focused on just themselves, right? That there was rarely ever like, um, this thought of focusing on or thinking about how something may impact someone else. Like I, and and I'll say this, I think I paid a price a couple of times for in my career, um, Emily, for probably trying to implement Southern, Southerness into when I lived Mm -hmm. East. Yeah, I, yeah, people have, sometimes people have thought maybe I had another agenda and no, I didn't have an, I really didn't have another agenda. I was just sort of taught that if you can help people, you do it. It occurred to me, I'd love your thoughts on this. I wonder if it also has to do with a sense of personal development and self-esteem, because I do think in the South, you, one tends to hear positive words back from themselves, from women a lot, Mm -hmm. you know, from mothers, from grandmothers, from women on the street, women openly compliment each other and encourage each other. Um, They tend to form ways so that you can succeed together. You know, I I remember receiving my report cards and um, if I had all A's, you know, my parent, of course, or whatever, yay. And I, my neighbors waited for me to get my report card. You come back, let me know again when you get your report card. And I'm like, I'm thinking, wow. So it's like probably 
six people on the street looked at my report card and had five dollars for me right and <laughs> or whatever the case may be yeah. um at church there was the same thing there was this who made the honor roll or whatever but there was just a constant everywhere i went there was this constant affirmation i would love to hear your thoughts on how white women can step in and do their part with the black lives matter movement yeah. how can we be better yeah i you know i've been hearing a lot about the need for allies and you know i think right now white women are going to have i think the first step is that white women really have to acknowledge their privilege in this moment right because how, how do you want that to look how what's the best way to have that look well i think i think one is just to acknowledge it i am privileged in a more privileged position because i'm a white woman right um i don't live when people when people see you versus see me they well they they both they make a set of assumptions about both of us so let's just be fair when people see a white woman they're going to make an assumption when people see a black woman they're going to make an assumption but but more than likely the assumption of a white woman being correct or innocent is going to or, or being believable is first right so there you you can look at me and based on how my hair is you probably have no idea i went to do for grad school right not that that matters right but when you see me that's not the first assumption you're going to make now do you think that's true when i see you or when a man sees you i think it's i think it's true when white people see you right right even white white women white men but also when when black people see white people i wish we lived in a world where i didn't have to make the assumption that she could not be open to who I am, right? That she could truly not be an ally. Because of the conversation I've been having with my, and I hate to say this, but white friends and girlfriends and colleagues, they have all been saying, Crystal, I don't feel like I can do enough. I don't feel like I'm doing enough in this moment. Is what I'm doing being helpful? And I can, ima I can only imagine what it's like to be a white woman in this moment and to want to help but you don't even a really know where to start you don't feel like you're able to do enough and that you know i can't speak to it from that perspective that has to be frustrating that i mean that has to be well very frustrating what is i think what's difficult and i'll speak as a white woman yeah. um what is difficult at the base of it is that women don't have full power yet yes so um so it's like when a white woman comes out she's like I'm, i know i'm privileged here but i know i'm still at the mercy of this here absolutely i know i want to help here but i don't want to be in the way here i do often feel kind of like i want to help and I have no idea how. You feel powerless. I feel powerless. Yeah. Set your own personal benchmarks. Did I have a win this week? Did I have a win today? And what that looks like. And you just have to trust that every action of good that you put out into the world will have a ripple effect. Do you see it today? No. Will it? You know, it will show up and it will manifest itself. And, you know, What's on your wish? What's your number one? You have a magic wand and you get to fix inequity in this space. Where are you fixing it? We, you know, I feel like I've not given up on the adults, but I just feel like children are so innocent. They didn't ask for any of this stuff, <laughs> you know, and we owe them. Um, the, uh, we owe them to fix it. And, and if we don't fix it for them, they will grow up and they will not be as productive as they can be. And we'll keep saying, oh, 
Here we go again, same cycle, but I think we owe it to our children to make certain that they have a decent education. They have decent health care. <laughs> they are able to eat. Like I'm, I'm having this conversation in America, not a third world country, right? But right. I, there are just some basic tenets that I wish children would grow up with and it creates for them a sense of, um, it, it creates a sense, no, that should be normal. For yes, it should be normal. It should be normal. It shouldn't be, oh wow, I want them to grow up with a view of the world or just basic tenets. I hope. I hope that in the future, they look back and they're like, oh my God, Crystal asked to make sure that people had health care and food. What? Right. <laughs> what kind of monsters were they? <laughs> and, that, and that these babies had a chance to learn. Like, they had a chance to learn, right? Like, yeah. that's all I hope. I mean, like, if I, if I could level it, I, when I see pictures of little kids now and just the whole pictures of kids sitting outside of Taco Bell to get access to free Wi-Fi with their parents. Like I, yeah. I've heard stories of people that I know their relatives are they couldn't afford Wi-Fi, uh, and they were told to go sit in places where they could get a connection. Or there was one computer for four children. I mean, those things break my heart. I mean, because the what it says it what it says to a child is you're not valued. Yes. Um, and I think that is if we could, we have to fix it for them. Yes, um, I agree. I agree. Yeah. That's that's something I always think about it. A reverse engineer. You said something earlier, and it is true. People always resist change because of what they think they're going to lose mm -hmm. over the change. But this change is so important and so long overdue that people need to ask themselves daily, what are we going to lose if we don't make this change? Yeah. You know, we, ca we, cannot, we cannot let another day or week or decade pass without making equity stick. It is our only chance at survival of the human race. Mm -hmm. And we must fight at all cost to retain a fair and democratic society. Yeah. You know, yeah. we, we must, we, we, we must. Yep. And I hope, you know, I hope, you know, this pivotal moment in history, children, if no one else will look back and say someone fought for me because I had no voice. Yes. And, um, and I think that I think we owe a debt. We owe them the chance to um, be positioned to do well in life. So I want to take back that just sense of I don't want to sound funny, but being human, just yeah, you know, like we show up with no pretense, no agenda. There's not trying to get anything right. <laughs> it really is. How are you doing? Are you okay? You're good. We're good. And I just would love to get back to that. There, you know, there's no trying to climb or get something. Folks are just really like, I'm alive today. It's good. Happy to see you. <laughs> Maybe I would, today, but I would love to find a way to do that with you. I would love to find a way to just be outside and hang out. Yeah, yeah, and I think we'll find our tribe. We'll know quickly, like, nope, that's not what we're doing here. We're not trying to create a new thing or um, make a new introduction for you, but it really is just enjoying humanity. And that's that, and, and being sisters. Yes. Oh, my gosh. That's the real word, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Moving past friendship into being sisters. Yeah. How do we, how do we be sisters? How do we? truly live together in that way and maybe I'm naive I think we can get there but it's um and I think because you and I have seen what it looks like yes and folks just have to figure out how to get over their stuff so that it is truly 
and that becomes real. If white women think about it that way, not how do I help or how do I not help or how do I stand back? It's like, how do I be a sister? That's right. And that's what would a, what would a sister do? What would a, what would a sister do? What would a sister do? That's the question. Yeah. And that gives you every answer that you need to know. <laughs> My sister would do it. <laughs> yeah. One last question I always ask at the end of these, and by always, I mean the five times I've done it. Um, I always ask people to mention <coughs> their charity of choice. If someone watches you talk and you could say, please, if you want to help and the way you help is by giving money. I would, I want them to give to you. <laughs> yeah, I want, yeah, I do. That's why I wanted to do this talk. Yeah. Oh, this is sweet. Yeah, I want them to give to you. Yes. Thank you for those, those sisterly words to me. Yeah. I'm um, to and thank you for asking people to support this idea. I, um, I do truly feel that if we all had access to social and emotional language, our opportunities would be greater and our conflicts would be less. That is exactly right. Well, you're so, you're so just kind and lovely. Crystal, thank you for your time. And, um, it's great. I'm looking forward to many, many more.